Hi again. Today we're going to do chapter 7, which is the buyer's relations with other company personnel. Chapter 7. Now I'll be honest with you, I have no idea what most of the material in this chapter have to do with the title, uh, relations with other company personnel. The thing is, it's an incredibly important chapter. Why is this chapter so important? Well, there's a whole lot of policy specs that are in this chapter that are going to be important when you're doing your purchasing manual. If you remember, your purchasing manual is that manual you're going to do for your big final project at the end in that you have to have certain policies and procedures listed. This is a great chapter to pull some of those policies and procedures from. We're going to briefly talk about some of those as we go through. Um, so keep this chapter in mind, remember it, because it's really going to make your policy writing easier. So. One of the first things uh, in this chapter, one of the few things I think it has to do with company personnel, is the difference between a job specification and a job description. Job specification are basically the skills needed to do the job. So if you need to be good at math, if you need to be good at English. A job description is basically what the job is, the different tasks you have to do to do the job. So you should probably know that one. I believe there's a test question on that uh, somewhere soon. Pretty much the rest of this chapter, the, the important part, is on selection and procurement policies. These are the things, as I mentioned, are going to go into your manual. Um, there's a whole list of them. We're going to go through some of the major ones. Now, a lot of these are an either or. In other words, they may be a, a, a something you're for, something you're against. For example, gifts from suppliers. How do you feel about your purchasing manager, purchasing personnel taking a gift from a supplier? I think that can depend on a lot of circumstances. One, if you're the purchaser, do you have a problem if U.S. Foods comes in every Christmas and puts a case of steaks and a bottle of alcohol on your desk and says Merry Christmas? You may buy from them now, they're just being nice to you. What if you're not buying from them? So that's one scenario. What if you're not the purchaser? What if you have somebody else in that purchasing position? Do you have a problem then if somebody comes in and puts a case of steaks on their desk and a bottle of alcohol? Put yourself in my position as a state purchasing authority. If someone comes in and does that, I've actually just violated state law. Now, why might that be good? Why might that be bad in, in your situation? The reason we talk about gifts from suppliers is, is if we look at undue stress or an enticement from a buyer uh, when it's not in the best interest of the company. So you give me a case of steaks, you give me a bottle of alcohol, and I say, well, fine, I'll buy from you now. It may not be the best purchasing decision for the company, but I'm going to buy from you because you've given me these gifts. You've swayed my opinion to buy from you regardless of what's right for the company or not. And so that's why a policy on gifts, um, like I said, from a state purchasing standpoint, it's just not allowed. And at a mom and pop shop, if somebody wants to bring you a case of steaks in order to get you to buy from them, is that a bad thing? You know, I, I don't know. That's up to you. Favoring suppliers, another issue. Why do you buy from one company or another? Well, hopefully you're buying because you're getting the best product, the best quality, the best price. But you might have somebody in your purchasing department that says, well, I buy from so-and-so. I just like them better. Well, why do you like them better? I will give you an exact uh, instance that we had uh, on a, a school like such as this one, where we had uh, a person in a purchasing position that was buying from someone because they were a friend. Uh, they were of the same gender. They were friends with them. It didn't matter what the price was. It didn't matter what they could get from the company. They liked these people. And they bought from them because they liked them. Now, I think it's important that you like your purveyor. Uh, being friends with them and sitting down and talking about your family and things like that and just being good old boys, I think that crosses a line. Um, so I think you have to, once again, have a policy on that. Why do we purchase from certain people? We purchase based on quality. We purchase on price. And personal like and dislike should never lay into it. Uh, I think I might have mentioned before, I have a brother-in-law who is a sales rep for Reinhardt Foods. There is no way, and pardon me about the phone there, 
but there is no way or reason that I would ever purchase from Mine Heart Foods. Sorry about the phone. Uh, next thing, approved supplier list. Would it be a good idea to have a su approved apply supplier list and that says that your purchasing director or purchasing manager can only buy from people on that list? I think that's a great idea. That prevents someone from going out saying, oh, I heard I can get a great deal from XYZ company. Let me go ahead and buy from them and see what it's like. Not necessarily a good idea to take chances. Um, if the purchasing director or manager or owner has done their job, and they have set up good policy guidelines for purchasing, there really should be no reason for somebody to go out and buy from a non-approved supplier. Um, other things you can do, other policies, limiting the amount of quantity a purchaser could buy. So you may want to limit what a person can buy by amount or by dollar uh, in order to keep them from purchasing too much. It's a way of having a control over somebody. Uh, we have it here on this campus. If I want to spend more than $1,000, I have to have an extra signature on a purchase order. Once again, preventing me from just spending all the money that I, I want to spend. You might also have a, a limit on the amount you can spend per item. So you're able to buy all the beef you want, but you can't go over $8 a pound. Once again, trying to keep a little bit of control and keeping uh, surprises from happening in the, the end. What about making purchase personal purchases? Would you allow your staff to buy from U.S. Food or Cisco or Reinhardt Food and buy their ribs for their summer picnic directly from the supplier? Some would say that's not any big of a deal and it might be a nice perk to allow your, your people to do that. But could that get in the way of business? If I'm worried more about buying my personal groceries and not worried about buying things from the company, could that be an issue? It might be, so that would be a good policy to have. Uh, reciprocity. Reciprocity basically means if you buy from me, I'll buy from you type of thing. We don't see this too much when you're buying from a big supplier, um, although you could. So if, for example, if I'm going to buy from you, then you're going to give me certain things in return, which might be okay, uh, might not be okay. We're going to talk more about that in this and, and other chapters. Uh, accepting free samples. We've talked about this one before, and the thing about accepting free samples is sometimes people can take a real advantage of it. Um, we've mentioned this where, say, the seafood restaurant says, yeah, I like to sample the steaks. So he has case after case of steaks sent in. He has no desire to ever sell those steaks. He's taking them home and putting them home on the grill. Eventually, somebody's got to pay for that. Where I'm getting free samples, someone somewhere along the way has to be paying for that beef. So... Free samples can be a problem. Ethically, you should only take free samples and order free samples when you plan to use them. Once again, we go back to when we have a good relationship with our purveyor. Uh, the people we buy from are instrumental in helping us be successful or, or, or not being successful. So why would we order a bunch of product that we're not going to pay for? All that's going to do is drive up the cost. Um, another side of that is I know people who say, yeah, I, I'd like to try some different ketchups, so send me a case of every ketchup you've got. I don't think you necessarily have to do that. Uh, and, uh, there's so many products out there, yeah, it is kind of hard to say, I want this one for sure. But I think you can do these things on a smaller scale. In the ketchup example, what are you going to do if you have six number 10 canned cases of ketchup? Ask me enough ketchup for a lifetime. So you have to be smart about this sampling, and I think you have to respect your... Uh, your purveyor. Same thing with equipment. Some companies will let you demo and use equipment to see if you like it. Don't do it unless you really plan to use it. It's not like the people who buy a dress and then wear it once and then take it back. Completely different thing. So, um, backdoor selling, another issue. And this kind of is like a chain of command. So, say a salesman has tried to get to me to sell me a piece of equipment. And I just don't have time for it. So instead, the salesman goes to my chef and says, hey, I want you to try this piece of equipment. And if you like it, you know, go to Chef Rice and tell him about it. Back to our selling. 
uh, can be real annoying. So it's my chef has other things to do. I don't need him talking to sales reps. And that can happen with food. It goes back to where we talked about brokers uh, um, in an earlier chapter, where brokers come in and their job is to get their product in no matter what. Uh, other issues, accepting discounts. Um, do you accept discounts? Under what circumstances? Uh, when's it appropriate? I mean, we obviously all like to save money. And there are a couple times when discounts can be, uh, you know, an honest above board thing. Quantity discount. When I'm going to buy a pallet of paper towels versus one case of paper towels. I'm buying a huge quantity. The more I buy, the better deal I should get. Volume discount. Now instead of just buying paper towels by the pallet, I want a pallet of hand soap and a pallet of toilet paper. So the sheer volume of everything I'm buying um, should be good enough to discount the price somewhat. Cash discount. Some companies will give you a discount if you give them cash instead of credit or instead of writing a check or things along that line. We'll talk about this more in a later chapter, but basically when you sign up for a company, you can get different terms. The, the best for the company is cash. You buy something, they bring it to you, you give them cash. But you might look for terms like net 30 days. So in other words, you have 30 days to pay your bill or a net 60 days to pay your bill. Um, when that happens, if we go way back to the beginning and we talk about the, the time value of money, if that company is giving you food today, but you're not paying on it on 60 days, basically that's not as good for them. They want to get their money and move on. So they might give a discount for cash. Uh, there might also be a promotional discount. We see these all the time, especially if you go to a food show. If you go to a food show and they'll say, well, if you buy two cases this week, we'll give you $15 off case. Nothing wrong with that ethically. Everyone gets the same deal. Now, the only problem would be if they say, I tell you what, I'm going to give you a special price on this for every case you buy, and they don't give it to everyone else. But promotional discounts are fun. Another good policy to have, supporting local purveyors and suppliers and farmers. So do we have a company policy that we're going to buy local when we can? Sounds great, doesn't it? Farm to table. Uh, I've talked in some of the classes about the Metropolitan Farmer, which is a restaurant in Springfield that I like, which is farm to table. They've got a big chalkboard that lists all the products they get locally, where they get it from. Sounds great. The problems you run into when you try to buy local is sometimes those restaurant suppliers cannot produce everything that the restaurant wants. Uh, compared to the big farms, they, they may not have the land. They may have other uh, people wanting to buy their product. They may have a bad crop, and since they're not one of the large mega super farms, they can't recover. Um, one thing about going to the farmer uh, is I love all the fresh type of things, but the product varies from week to week to week because they're buying from these small, almost boutique farms. So some week the greens are really tender and sweet, and other weeks, because they couldn't get those, they tend to be bitter and a little bit tougher. And some weeks they just don't have them because, well, we couldn't get them this week. So... Buying from a local fair is a great idea, but is it always the best thing for your restaurant? So you might want to have a policy about that. We support the local farm community, however, we tend to buy... Anyway, you understand what I'm saying. Shopping procedures. What days of the week do you order? How do we shop? How do we purchase? You could have, once again, another 50 procedural um, policies in your purchasing manual on that topic alone. Now, something else that may be good for your purchasing manual is performance reviews. In other words, how do we rate the performance of your purchasing department? And I think that's a great thing to have in the manual. It, it shows them exactly what you're going to be looking for. Now, I think we have a, a discussion question on this as well. Uh, it, it's an interesting topic because a lot of the things that we would rate the success or failure of the purchasing department on are based on the actions and the success or failure of our purveyors. Well, how can we say you've done a great job purchasing department or you've sucked as a purchasing department based on what somebody else is doing? If it's my job as director of purchasing to make sure the product is here, it is the right quality, is of the right price, and I'm having trouble with a the purveyor, then I should take action. 
it is my job to make sure that these purveyors are giving us the product we want at the price we want. So for example, if we have things like stockouts, and a stockout is where we run out of product because they don't deliver it. And why might they not deliver it? Well, they might not deliver it because, give me just one second here, they might not deliver it because they're out. All right, they've had a run on pork ribs. We're out this week. We don't have anything to substitute, so I'll stock out. Late deliveries. Well, we didn't have a special today because the truck didn't get here in time. Checking prices. Prices fluctuate, uh, and there's a whole lot of tricks that um, food service companies can use to, uh, to raise prices on people. For example, one of the, the, the big tricks is changing prices in midstream. It's statistically, people will check their bill the first of the month, and they check their bill the last of the month when they get it, but they don't check the bill in the middle months or the two weeks in the middle. They just kind of assume. So what you'll see from an unscrupulous supplier is you'll see prices be steady the first week and the last week, but in the two middle weeks, prices take a jump. Um, you'll see companies that will buy in at this price and then over gradually over years you see the price go up, the price go up, price go up. And if you don't catch that on your invoices, um, I've seen people paying double and even triple what they started out paying. Um, so your sales rep there is to make money. So you got to remember that. So can we say the purchasing director is doing a good job or a bad job based on those factors I've just given you? If we're getting things uh, late, if we're running out of items, would it be my job as a purchasing director to find another company or to make changes to ensure that those things don't happen? Yes, I think that is a, a great way to evaluate somebody. Other things you can look at, you might have a performance uh, evaluation based on budgets. Did you meet the budget? Did you have staff turnover, things like that? You might also look at operational performance, general purchasing duties. Um, you know, were things brought in properly? Were they put away? Did we lose any product due to improper storage? Uh, with the staff trained properly? Things like that. One final thing we may look at might, would be inventory turnover. And inventory turnover basically means how quickly are we getting product from that loading dock into the customers uh, and, and on their plates. If we're buying product improperly and we're having a lot of product come in and it sits on the shelf, we don't turn it over quickly, it basically costs us money. because We've spent money and it sits there. We need that product to turn over quick. We need to get it in, sell it, make money on it, and get new product. So a higher product turnover would mean the purchasing director is doing a better job of purchasing the right amount of product at the right time. So that's chapter seven for you. Once again, it doesn't really have a lot to do with buyer relations with company personnel, but it is chock full of good procedures uh, for your purchasing manual that you should be working on now. So as always, do your discussion question, read your chapters, and we'll see you again real soon. Take care.